Okay. Right. Okay, Vincent, go ahead and start. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. We are we have the pleasure um, of inviting art historian and conservator Dr. Habil Svetlana Olianina. Um, uh, Svetlana is the head of Department of Graphic Arts of the National Technical University of Ukraine, the Igor Skogovsky Polytechnic Institute in Kiev. Her focus is the histor historical design aspects of Ukrainian iconostasis. She obtained her PhD uh, from the Department of uh, the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in Kiev in 2005. She previously interned at the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Granada in Spain in 1996 to 97. And she was the head of the Institute for Cultural Research at the National Academy of Arts of Ukraine in Kiev uh, from 2008 to 2016 and achieved uh, Dr. Habil status in 2020 from the Lviv National Academy of Arts. Over the years, she has published more than 50 articles of various aspects of iconostasis and its history, including her 2019 book, Ukrainian Iconostasis. Um, so we're delighted to have uh, Svetlana today, which is absolutely great. This is going to be a brilliant presentation. But as I said previously before, um, Yuri has kindly um, is acting as a Q&A &A facilitator and a translator. And just a, a, an introduction to Yuri. Um, Yuri uh, Yungchisha is a New York City-based conservator of wooden artifacts and a Fulbright specialist and scholar teaching wood conservation in Ukraine since 2018. So please, when you're ready, Svetlana, um, we'd like to see your presentation, please. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you for uh, the UKMOS UK Wood Committee for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my presentation will focus on the Ukrainian iconostasis its history, construction, and uh, methods of preservation during the Soviet period after World War II. Um, the word iconostasis refers to a partition in Christian church of Eastern Rite, typically made of wood, which separates the altar from the congregation. The religious purpose of this petition was to separate the area of the church where Eucharist is performed from other larger portion of the church accessible to all the faithful. In its current form, of, it consists of several tiers of icons which are painted wooden panels of religious imagery with a double door passage to the altar in the central section called the royal doors and uh, single doors on either side called the deacon's doors. The origin of this form dates to 6th century in Byzantium. This uh, partition separating the sanctuary from the nave called a temple. Over time, this barrier evolved into the architectural construction we know today. The Eastern Slavic iconostasis originated at the end of the medieval period in the 14th to 15th centuries as a simple horizontal icon panel support called a tableau, which consisted of wood beams set onto the walls or the post pillars of a church. In wooden churches, they formed a part of the church construction. Groups of icons were placed on these beam members, today called beam iconostasis, in two to four tiered rows. Although many of these icon groupings have survived to our present day, the beam iconostasis of this period have not. That is why we still do not have a definitive answer as to whether these early construction were merely simple support for icons or whether they were elaborately carved. This early beam iconostasis of the 15th to the 12th half of the 16th century 
did not have separating frame, frames for the icons. The icons of the upper tiers were painted on long boards and the individual religious narratives were separated by painted or engraved vertical stripes. In contrast, framed iconostasis, this individual painted icon, icons probably existed by the end of the 16th century as documented by a drawing of such a construction found in the personal diary of Martin Grunewald from the 1580s of the Church of the Assumption in Lviv, today in Western Ukraine. The earliest and best preserved iconostasis in Ukraine is in the Paraskeva Church in Lviv, in Western Ukraine, circa 1610. This construction is representative of a transformation which took place in the 16th century. The medieval horizontal beam iconostasis was transformed during this early modern period into the iconostasis as we know it today, a frame construction. As you can see, every icon in the iconostasis of the Paraskeva church has its own enclosure and the entire iconostasis is covered with these relief carvings. However, this new iconostasis was not a complex of several different frames. It was a unified architectural form containing architectural elements such as arched passages to the altar, columns, councils, and corbels. In central Ukraine, the architectural and decorative design of the iconostasis of the Kyiv Metropolitanate also underwent a similar development at the end of the 16th century. Even so, they still retain the horizontal rows of icons, as in the beam iconostasis. This construction in central and eastern Ukraine reached their apogee during the second half of the 17th century through the first half of the 18th century, when the Baroque style prevailed in Ukraine. Their specific architecture and ornamentation became, became their most characteristic feature, which distinguished them from other national variants of that period. During this period of icons, in the central portion of the iconostasis became elevated. This began this slight stepwise rise, uh, rising of the corners above the royal doors portal. This led to the introduction in the 18th century of cornices, these concentric curved arches above the royal doors. This in turn led to the central form of the iconostasis rising significantly, resembling a mountain. Thus, this iconostasis of the 17th to 18th centuries created a previously unknown impression of commanding monumentality. The increase in height was significant. The iconostasis of the first half of the 17th century are typically four to six meters in height. However, by the second half of the 17th century to 18th century, many of them were up to 20 to 22 meters high. To achieve this imposing scale, the individual icon panels became larger and the number of icon tiers increased. While the iconostasis of the first half of the 17th century had four to five tiers, they would have six to seven tiers by the end of the century. This period was also highlighted by a pronounced flourishing of iconostasis decoration. Entire surfaces became elaborately and densely carved with gilded and sometimes silver flowers, fruit garlands and rosettes, Lashakanfus leaves and vines. 
these carved floral motifs were not only three-dimensional, but were often mounted in two layers in the iconostasis, lower tiers. As a result, the iconostasis began to take on the form of an open pierced gilded curtain. As a liturgical object, the composition, decorative carvings, and painted surfaces of the iconostasis were richly symbolic. As such, the sponsors of the largest and most complex structures of the Kyiv metropolitan churches were its hierarchs. They would initiate a project in the oral or writing and then hire the best carving and painting masters to execute it. The current masters were called Snitsas, and they created the architectural and decorative section of the iconostasis with the assistance of apprentices. Also, most of the masters' names have been lost. A few examples have survived in documents. For example, it is known from invoices and other work documents that the carving of the iconostasis of the Assumption Church in Lviv of 1629 to 38 were executed by Stanislav Dreher and the 1729 iconostasis of the Assumption Church, Assumption Cathedral in the Kiev Pictures Clavra was carved by the sneezer Grigory Petrov. At that time, every major city in Ukraine had master carvers and groups of their apprentices. Therefore, the, we occasionally come across, uh, come across name of masters in Kyiv, Chernihiv, Nizhny, Poltava, Lubny in archival documents. In Western Ukraine, significant artistic centers were Lviv and Zhokhova, whose masters built and carved the iconostasis of that region. Regional current styles are distinguishable. Kyiv and Eastern Ukraine are characterized by bold three-dimensional open pierced carving, while in Western Ukraine, low relief carving dominated. The situation changed in the second half of the 17th to 18th century, when it became very costly to build large iconostasis, which were richly carved and decorated. Only the wealthiest monasteries and magnates could finance such undertakings. Among the latter, the Cossack hetmans were the most frequent benefactors and sponsors. Historic documentation reveals that formal contra contracts existed between the sponsors and the individuals who would execute their iconostasis buildings and decoration. Typically, these documents describe the arrangement in general terms, primarily focusing on the quality of the materials, such as specifying pigments from veins and the carving. This uh, only the payment terms outlined in detail. In detail. For example, um, a rather complete contract has been preserved of the 1685 construction of the iconostasis of the Transfiguration Cathedral of the Mharsky Monastery, concluded between the hetman Ivan Samoylovich and the carver Stepan Mutyanitsa. It states that the master will undertake the building and carving of, of an iconostasis according to a drawing provided to him. In turn, the hetman is responsible for the payment of 2,000 Polish coins to the carver and his apprentices, as well as providing for their lodging and sustenance. Fascinating details include the provision of textiles, textiles for clothes, firewood, candles, and among other, 15 cows, 60 sheep, and 20 pigs for food. The construction of this iconostasis lasted four years 
from 1685 to 1689. For that period, two to four years was typical for such an undertaking provided that the work's work was continuous. Linden was the work of choice used for the carving and icon panels, while the woods used for the frames of the iconostasis are being researched. The joinery of large structural elements is also being researched. Carvings were executed directly on the main structural elements, while smaller ornamental carved fragments were adhered to this protein glue and fastened with wooden pins or wooden nails. The mounted decor was carved with Levkaz, Ukrainian for Jason, and the coating of bowl, and then water gilded or oil gilded with gold leaf. Individual carved elements, such as flowers or grapes, were occasionally silvered and then given a transparent glaze of colored varnishes in red or green hues. Structural elements, which were not covered with a carved decor, were usually painted blue or white. Other colors, such as red, were also introduced in the middle of the 18th century. The Baroque period, the high point in Ukrainian iconostasis art, ended during the middle of the third quarter of the 18th century. A new style, classicism, began to develop in the following years, bringing with it a very different set of aesthetic ideals in ecclesiastical art. Later, there increased and increasingly during the 19th century, the artistic forms of the Ukrainian Baroque iconostasis were no longer fashionable and were thought of as hopelessly out of date. The Russian Empire's ruling and cultural elite considered them to be of little value and they were only left in place due to the high cost of constructing new ones. At the first opportunity, however, such an iconostasis would be replaced and it would be dismantled, sold and passed to small parish churches or were stored such as a bell tower where they gradually deteriorated. Be that as it may, losses of the Ukrainian Baroque iconostasis due to natural aging or stylistic replacement were minimal during the 19th century. Most of them were still intact in their churches at the beginning of the 20th century. Also, some of the lost during um, period of World War I and shortly afterwards, it was only during the Soviet period of the 1930s that iconostasis found themselves at the epicenter of governmental anti-religious initiatives. Churches were closed and services were forbidden, being thought of as opium for the people, a phrase that appeared in numerous publications, publications of the Soviet Ukraine. For example, here you can see a fencing of, uh, fencing off of the iconostasis before dismantled. Afterwards, the began of the purposeful destruction of religious artifacts. Uh, very preliminary statistic, numbering about 400. The were cut into pieces and burned. This destruction was not limited to iconostasis, but included the Torah Ark of Jewish synagogues or the carved altars from Roman Catholic churches as well. During this period, a very small number of icons and individual carvings were saved by museum staff members as examples of icon painting styles 
or the history of the decorative arts. Any reference to the destruction of these masterpieces in Soviet publication of the time was strictly prohibited. By the time World War II began, most iconostasis of the Eastern Ukraine were destroyed and uh, any surviving members were then heavily damaged during the war period. These anti-religious initiatives ceased in the post-war period. The catastrophic level of cultural heritage destruction during the 30s and war period prompted Soviet authorities to change their attitude to the remain religious art objects. During the 1960s, programs of the preservation and restoration of cultural heritage objects began to include iconostasis as well. It should be emphasized that not a single 17th century iconostasis remained in Eastern Ukraine at the time, and only seven 18th century Baroque iconostasis, iconostasis miraculously survived in various states of damage. These iconostasis were restored by governmental conservation institutions during the late 1960s through the early 1990s. In the following portion of my presentation, I would like to highlight the restoration specific of two of them, the Sorochinsky iconostasis of 1731 to 1732, and the iconostasis from Kozelets village from 1752 to 1763. Today, the Sorochinsky iconostasis remains an unsurpassed masterpiece of Ukrainian Baroque art. It was constructed under the patronage of Hetman Danilo Apostol for the church building he had built on his ancestral estate. Information regarding the church builders or iconostasis carvers is unknown. However, the quality of the icon painting suggests that the best painters of the time created them. Bertis Pavlovsky from Kiev pictures Laura or Vasily Reklinsky from Poltava. The structure reached a height of 17 meters and a width of 22 meters spanning the entire width of the church. The Sorochinsky iconostasis housed 130 icons painted in oil on a Lefkaz ground using a multi-layered painting and glazing technique. Restoration documents of the 1960s note that the iconostasis carvings, carvings were executed in Linden. Wood identification of the structural members is being planned. Although this church managed to avoid the purposeful governmental destruction of the 1930s, other tragedies befell it. Bombing during the World War II significantly damaged it, and then it stood with a ruined dome and unglazed windows for a long period of time. Atmospheric precipitation and uh, wide temperature fluctuations quickly added to the damage of the iconostasis. A further tragedy was a lightning strike and a fire in 1961. Then restorers examined it, examined it in the second half of the 1960s. The Sorochinsky iconostasis evoked the appearance of half-ruined masterpiece. It was structurally unstable, had lost 12 of its icons, as well as numerous decorative art se section, sections. The gilded lefkas covering the carving, as well as the icon painting surfaces, were delaminating or lost in many areas. The rescue of this icon, iconostasis, began with a complete before treatment photo documentation, followed by a scientific analysis of the painted and decorative surfaces. 
This analysis became the basis of the treatment protocol, which began in 1969. The icons were designated from the iconostasis and transported to Kyiv to be restored, while the iconostasis structure was conserved and restored on site. Treatment of the iconostasis began destabilizing the iconostasis structural elements utilizing either height or sturgeon glue. A particularly challenging aspect of the treatment was restoration of lost fragments of the iconostasis. Similar preserved decorative elements were selected as samples for restoration carving, which will then carried out this a faithful approximation of the original using the same wood, linden. Various surfaces, including the existing lip cast and gilding, were stabilized with sturgeon glue and then dust, salt, and other contaminants were removed using undocumented techniques. Newly prepared lip cast was applied to original very small missing section and uh, then painted these watercolors to imitate gilding. However, a key question arose as, as to the treatment of newly attached missing half section. What should be the degree of the restoration intervention? A conservative approach was chosen in keeping this a newly prescribed Soviet restoration practices of the time. An example of this approach is the frame surrounding the Madonna and Child. Larger replacement, large replacement missing card in a scarf section were left intact and not covering this left cast or gilding. This approach permitted to permitted the aesthetic reintegration of the iconostasis of the carbon, while at the same time differenti differentiation original surfaces from restoration efforts. As a result of this decision, the true volume of lost material is easily seen today. This treatment lasted two decades and was completed in, in the late uh, 1980s. The restored icons were returned and reinstalled in the Sorochinsi iconostasis. The second restoration example is the iconostasis in the Cathedral of the Nativity of the Virgin in Kozilets village, Chernihiv region, which took place at the same time. This late Baroque iconostasis reached a height of 27 meters in, in its central section. In the 1960s, this iconostasis was in very poor and damaged condition, with many missing icons, including all the royal and Dickens stores. As this uh, previous example, the remaining icons were disengaged from the iconostasis and sent to Kyiv for restoration. In contrast, the previous example, upon completion of their restoration, the icons were installed in the Chernihiv Museum. New icons, not identical to the original, were then painted and installed in the original iconostasis. This decision negated the historic integrity of the iconostasis and diluted its importance as a historic document. However, the restoration of iconostasis itself is fascinating since the restorer, Mr. Emma Rampolsky, left very detailed documentation regarding of his procedures, formulation and ingredients, providing us with an opportunity to look back and reflect on the restoration practices of more than 40 years ago. A brief outline follows. The entire iconostasis 
was disinfected on both sides with a 4% formalin solution in water for the painted surfaces and um, for porcelain from four um, percent formalin solution in alcohol for the gilded surfaces. This was done to disinfect the surfaces from any mold or surface insect activity. Paint layers of the iconostasis and the lefkas of the gilded and carved surfaces were stabilized with an, an emulsion of damar varnish, purified beeswax, beeswax and pinene, and for the destruction of turpentine. The proportion of these ingredients varied depending on various surfaces. The laminating paint layers included the ground, the laminating paint layers with the ground intact, or the laminating ground uh, gilding layers. The stabilization procedure was interesting as well. Tracing paper impregnated this, uh, the warm emulsion was laid to the surface and lightly pressed the small heated spatulas. Surface contaminants of the paint layers were removed after three to five days of stabilization, stabilization using a, a slightly acidic soap solution at pH 5.5. The Lefkas gesso losses were filled this restoration Lefkas made of chalk, casein, linseed oil, and an oil varnish. A protective isolation, isolating layers uh, was applied to all surfaces which would be in painted or toned. This emulsion consisted of one part of damar varnish, two parts of pining, one part of linseed oil. Painting loss areas were in painted with, in, with oil paints dispersed in a solution of 100 grams of damar varnish, 100 grams of pining, and 10 grams of beeswax. Lost carbon fragments were replaced with new carbons using existing samples as models. A section of wood of the same species was attached to these uh, protein glue and wooden pins at the carbon loss areas. The wood was selected considering the fiber direction of the original fragment. The wood was then carved, then left to it from original section as in the Sorochensi iconostasis. This treatment record was very complete for its day, listing the ingredients and the step-by-step -step methods of preparing the emulsions and coatings. It gave practical advice on application techniques and time intervals between each procedure. Now, what can be said in these two treatment examples executed in the 1970s through 1980s, imperfect as they, uh, as they are by today's standards, is that they stabilized the objects differentiated between original and restoration efforts and prevented the further deterioration of two outstanding examples of 18th century Ukrainian iconostasis art. They are preserved to our present day. I would like to conclude my presentation with them complex iconostasis history of one notable church, the church of um, St. Ilim, built in Subotiv, central Ukraine, in uh, 1653. It is unknown what happened to the original iconostasis. A replacement iconostasis in the classical style was installed in the 19th century which in turn was destroyed by the Soviets in the 1930s. The church 
the church was then used as a storage facility. After Ukraine declared independence in 1991, period photographs were used to recreate the 19th century iconostasis. However, this recreation was not completely faithful, as you can see in the treatment of the royal doors. During the 2000 congregation decided to install still another iconostasis carved in the Baroque style, a style which today has assumed a national ubiquitous character. This example of iconostasis originally created for their churches, which then became either lost or destroyed, followed by multiple iconostasis creations, um, replacement, transformation, and recrea recreation, recreations, um, highlight the challenging issues of historical authenticity that await anyone who delves into Ukrainian, Ukraine iconostasis history and their conservation. Thank you for your attention. This uh, concludes my presentation. However, I have two additional slides which you can see access on uh, the rec uh, recorded ver version of this presentation should you have any, uh, an interest. This slide um, highlights a short Ukrainian language bibliography of this subject. And uh, this slide highlight my Contact information should you be interested in touching my book, Ukrainian Iconostasis, Symbolism and Iconology uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you very, very, very much. Great. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. The quality of craftsmanship is is incredible. And, and I would imagine that um, I, I wondered if there were um, certain regions that were particularly famous for the quality um, or whether it was across the board. Uh, that was the, that was the, the sort of question I had. Пані Світляно, прошу переказати, чи були якісь дуже славні регіони в Україні, які прославлялися своїм різьбарством для тих іконостасів? Іконостаси Центральної України, відомі центри – це Київ і Чернігів. So the regions regarding the regions found in today's central Ukraine around the cities of Kyiv, which is today the capital of Ukraine, and Chernihiv, which was one of the capitals of the Cossack Hetmans for a period of time, had uh, the best examples of carving styles where you have the multi-layered open pierced carving. So this would be carving executed in two or maybe even more layers uh, in an open pierced style and then joined together either with wooden nails or wooden pins. Найбільші іконостаси створювалися для головних храмів Києва і Чернігова, а потім є відомості, що вони передавалися в церкви інших регіонів, інших міст. So the largest iconostases were built in the uh, cities of Kyiv and Chernihiv, but the carving uh, expertise and the building expertise of these iconostases was then uh, transferred to other countries. <laughs> 